what I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of RX Bars, which I had no idea at the time how big they were until I got a text that said they sold to Kellogg for $600 million. Check out that interview with Peter. Um, P90X founder Tony Horton talks about it. You know, you hear, um, Sean, about people making you know hundreds of millions of dollars, but he started off as a street mime. So he would make his food and rent money putting a hat on the street to make the money for the food in a, an apartment. I love hearing those stories. Um, the founder of Atari, Nolan Bushnell, talks about, you know, he was Steve Jobs' mentor, and he talked about how Steve offered him 33% of Apple for $50,000 and why he said no. Imagine that. Um, so, you know, this episode is brought to you by Rise25, which I co-founded with my business partner, John Corcoran, and our mission is to connect you with your best referral partners and customers. And we do that for, you know, for people, for what's been the best thing for my business in my life, which is a podcast. I believe it's been the best thing to help me connect and give to the people in my network and profile them. And um, we help the company completely run and launch your podcast. We distribute it across all the channels, um, you know, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify. And so you can show up and talk, spread your thought leadership, have your guests on, and we do everything else. Um, I credit to be the single best thing I've done. Um, it's not just a business. Um, it's about leaving a legacy. This is how John, you know, we're going to talk actually about how Sean, um, some of these groups have impacted his personal life, but I met my business partner through podcasting, best friends. We go on vacations together and it also helps you leave a legacy for you and your guest. Um, and so if you have, you know, I, I don't talk about much about this, Sean, and John told me to talk more about it, but the inspiration behind it is really um, my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor who escaped Nazi Germany, and the Holocaust Foundation interviewed my grandfather about his story, just atrocities that he had to endure, um, and that's, that his legacy lives on because of that interview, and it's on my about page on inspiredinsider.com, so if you want to check it out. But if you have a question about starting a podcast in general, I think if you're a business, you should do it 100%. It doesn't mean we have to run it for you. If you have questions, you know, email support at rise25.com and we're happy to answer them so you and your guests can leave a legacy. Um, I'm excited. Today we have Sean McGinnis, president and COO of YPO. Talk about making an impact because YPO, if you, don't, if you haven't heard of it, it's a global community of chief executives um, dedicated to becoming better leaders. And it's a platform that has more than 27,000 members in more than 138 countries in my opinion and other people's opinions, it's YPO is arguably one of the most powerful groups in the world. To qualify, a member has to have at least $10 million in annual sales. I was listening to you and Cameron Harold talk, people, a shout out to Cameron Harold and his podcast, but he was talking about how, I guess, the members of YPO in Thailand um, make up a, like a 30% of the GDP or something, you know, of you know, who are involved in YPO because of the impact, global impact in the national impact you guys and your members have. Sean began his career in South Africa, one of the country's largest producer of agricultural chemicals, and he founded an organizational development consulting business and an executive search business. Um, and currently is an advisor of two companies. Shout out to Newly, it's N-U-O-O-L-Y, which is a gig economy business for independent attorneys and REM Brothers, R-E-M Brothers, which is a hospitality and food service business. So if you're near Purdue University, um, near Lafayette or Dallas, check it out. Sean, thank you for joining me. Thank you, Jeremy. What a, what a pleasure uh, being with you. And, you know, just teeing off of your comment about your, your grandparents in the Holocaust, I've, I've had the privilege of visiting Yad Vashem in Jerusalem mm. <clears throat> several times over in the 20 year gaps in between. And I, I can't tell you what a, such a moving and emotional experience and, and what anchors it for me and it's what you and John are doing is you're connecting people with authentic stories and you're paying it forward by, you know, leveraging the lessons learned. And uh, my, I was just there in May again mm. and um, watched, a, you know, was at Yad Vashem and, and listened and watched um, a testimony from a survivor that, 
you know, it was just so extraordinary. And her, her story was she was saved as a child mm. um, and, and looked after by a French family. And she literally still goes back every year to this farmhouse. Remarkable story. Anyway, mm. I didn't mean to digress. but I No, really- it's, this is what it's about. There's no digression. It's wherever they, like I said, what made you go to Israel? Well, we, um, uh, my YPO chapter was doing its chapter retreat, and my wife and I hosted uh, 20 couples uh, at one of our signature events called Touch Israel, run by members from our Israeli chapters. It's just extraordinary what this group of members is able to do in four mm-hmm. days. It's really a deep dive, immersive deep dive into the culture, the Israeli culture, the Palestinian culture, um, all of the issues in that region. Talk about complexity. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Talk about complexity. And, by the way, this incredible underlying willingness to work together for a cause which is greater than ourselves, which is literally, how do we make things better? How do we, how do we embrace diversity of opinion, you know, and not get sucked into, you know, hatred and, um, you know, agendas, etc. I mean, that's, that we could take a year and not get through that discussion. Yeah. No, I love hearing your thoughts on that because, you know, hearing someone like that, a survivor or or whatever it is, it could be, you know, a CEO or someone going through a crappy time. And oftentimes we only see the surface level stuff, like things are going perfectly. And I love hearing those stories or I watched that that interview we did and and hearing those things because it's humbling and it puts perspective on things. And, you know, John and I always talk about, you know, let's say we're having a bad day or something's not going right. I'm like, well, at least I wasn't, my, my home wasn't burned out and I had to live in the woods for three weeks. Like I can go back to that and be like, okay, like really in the grand scheme of things, um, I'm okay. You know? Absolutely. And, you know, we, we, we grow up in the United States and, and first world countries with this very naively privileged perspective um, where, you know, particularly those individuals who don't travel. And I always encourage, you know, starting as young as you possibly can to travel and travel affordably and but go and see the rest of the world. Go and see how incredibly fortunate we are, mm. particularly in the United States. And by the way, the most giving um, culture in the world is the United States. We're so generous and we're so philanthropic, but we also get bent around the axle with, you know, with things that are just not important to talk about when you see how suffering exists in other places in the world. Anyway, you know, and, and I still think we're an incredible beacon of light to the rest of the world, and we should be. Um, and that's, um, you know, that's something that, you know, I personally am very, very, very keen to, to talk, you know, and I talk to friends about it a lot, and, you know, debate and civil discourse. If we can have a, a rational debate today, which is increasingly more difficult, it's how do we maintain those principles and that beacon of light um, because that's, that's what helps the world get better. Yeah. I want to talk about growing up in South Africa and what that was like, but I want to start with, you know, obviously you've had a lot of success in, in business, um, and, you know, helping run one of the most powerful organizations. What's been, when you think back, you know, on the challenge thing and tough times thing, what's been a big challenge or tough, uh, period that you had to push through? to get to where you are? You know, I think the first big one was really leaving South Africa. You know, it's never easy to leave the, the country of origin, all your connections, your family. Um, you know, that was, that was difficult. Mm. How uh, old were you? I was 25. And, you know, it was still in the midst of apartheid in South Africa. It was a very difficult time. I just finished, you know, a stint in the, in the uh, infantry, in the military service, and then uh, finished university and I'd worked for a couple of years. And, um, you know, I, at the time, you know, if I had a crystal ball, i my decision might have been different, but, you know, I didn't see, I didn't see the, the kind of successful resolution that occurred in South Africa. It was a remarkable, just a remarkable thing that people like Nelson Mandela and Bishop Tutu and, uh, Frederick W. de Klerk, um, the apartheid era president who really, galvanized with those two gentlemen and many, many others, lots of YPOs, by the way, participated in, in helping that go through. But, you know, it was, um, that was probably the most difficult. Um, and then going through a business failure, you know, I had a very, a very significant failure in 2008 with the, you know, collapse of the financial markets. I was at the time involved in a real estate business, building low income housing. 
and my wife, you know, who is a fellow EO member, we met through through EO, parents and wife EO, we were both in real estate, different ends of the market, mm. and within a week, all of the capital dried up, and that That's was crazy. That was a significant setback because you're you're not prepared for it. Real estate 2008 don't mix. Don't mix. Yeah, oh God. <laughs> So what do you do at that time? Like things. I, I think it's about resilience. I think it's about grit. Um, it's about the people that you surround yourself with. It's the friends that you've made over the years and the mm-hmm. contacts. And, you know, it's being smart enough to have, you know, some kind of safety blanket. So my wife and I are big savers, for example. And mm-hmm. it's very important to have that rainy day money. It doesn't have to be a lot. Um, and then also we found living within our means, you know, we were, we were not stretched from a, from a, you know, cost perspective. And that enabled us, you know, to tack left pivot, you know, both get involved in different things and, and literally, you know, pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and we had each other. I think, you know, that's such an important support system. My success, uh, you know, or or, um, my life experience has been having, you know, phenomenal partner to go through these things with and a support system at the time were you in an organization yeah, i was you know and ypo was incredible at that time not just for me but for many individuals whose businesses were significantly impacted around the world i mean you remember it it was devastating for terrible people. and in fact you know i think that's where organizations like ypo uh, are really the strongest is you know is at times tough of, times where we can help each other. What do you do next? So like, I mean, at the time looking back, like it was, it probably, you know, you end up on the better side of things, but at the time it's, it's devastating. What, what do you, how do you pivot and what do you well, do you after know, that? For me and, and for Maria, we both have an entrepreneurial spirit and I immediately went out and started another business. Um, I had two really good friends, Mark Kittle and Jack White, uh, both uh, in the electricity business, both, by the way, being left on the on the street uh, when Enron uh, collapsed. Wow. Both, both were builders of electricity power plants, and we put a little team together, raised some money. Um, we had an idea to, to really be a bridge to renewables. Um, so we started off with natural gas as a foundation. We did some consulting. And the last four years, I'm still actively involved advi- on an advisory level with that business. We're about to build a, you know, a really sizable, very, probably the cleanest natural gas power plant uh, that'll be built at the time. That's going to go up um, hopefully over the next two years. Um, but that's what you do. You, you just, you dig down, you find a way to, um, you know, uncover an opportunity yeah. and you get cracking. Um, I just, I didn't even, I didn't, we didn't spend a week worrying about it or, I mean, there was a little commiseration, I have to tell you. There was probably some Johnny Walker Black, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But you know, it's 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 amazing how people rally, and you yeah. know, everybody. Listen, you and we weren't alone. Every you know, there's so many people that have been in that boat, whether it's at that period in time or other periods of time. How did you get customers at the time? So you start this new venture, you raise capital, you get, you know, it's a, a trying time for the whole nation. How did you get customers? So it's relationships. Um, we, we were fortunate and we had, the three of us had existing relationships with, uh, with organizations that were looking to save money on their electricity spend. We did some wonderful consulting gigs with some major firms, a major Fortune 500s. Uh, we were looking to help several of them get off the grid and really, you know, for a lot of manufacturers, whether it's chip manufacturers or whether you're in manufacturing where electricity is a large part of your spend, helping them, you know, get a 20, 25% drop on their spend every year was significant. So we had a willing audience. We had a great um, value proposition yeah. value prop, and we had relationships. The other thing, you know, with, with organizations such as ours, you know, we have, we have a Rolodex where we can pick up the phone and say, would you be interested in hearing about something based on relationships? We don't yeah. solicit, we don't sell uh, to each other, but relationships are the lifeblood of anything basically. Now, were they relationships from people you knew from YPO or EO or? You know, relationships from previous businesses and then obviously a combination of EO relationships and YPO relationships. Network effect of those two organizations is extraordinary. Yeah. So the new tagline for YPO, even if the economy tanks, 
<laughs> you should join YPL because. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And you know, we, we say, and, and it's true because we've done research on this, time is the single you know, most precious resource that, you know, you have, I have, every business person that I know. So, you know, if you're going to get involved in, in spending money and dedicating time to a network or to an opportunity, it's important that you get value. And it's important that you can plug in with people that one are authentic, that are trustworthy. And in our instance, that are truly peers, so that you know, right from the get go, that these are individuals that have similar life experiences, maybe very diverse backgrounds, live in different parts of the world, different experiences, but the basic DNA enables you to connect quickly. Um, and that creates that bond or that, we call it a safe haven, but it enables you to really authentically ask or be vulnerable. You know, vulnerability is not a sin. It's not a failing. Uh, right. All of us have vulnerabilities. We all have blind spots. Um, but it's important to recognize that, one, we're not alone, and that there is a place where we can share either, you know, a need, uh, a particular issue, and get valuable, you know, input advice and, and additional opportunity creation. Sean, I mean, you have a unique perspective because you probably touch and are in contact with more YPO members and even groups than the normal person. I'm curious, looking over the year, past years, what are some of the big lessons you've learned um, from YPO members? And it may be from a success or it may be from a big mistake. What are some, a few of those lessons that maybe stick with you? I, I would say a big one for me, and it's, it's something that I'm seeing more and more and more, is to really cut through um, cut through anecdote and really focus to the extent you can on data, the utilization of facts and data in mm. making decisions or having conversations and not just data that you Google and get all online. I mean, you do it, but you know, get three or four different sources, actually pay attention to, you know, the realities on the ground. And the best way to do that, by the way, is to ask people that are doing it, that are in it. You know, if there's an issue like we had in El Paso recently, you know, and, and the big border immigration issues that the United States have, instead of, you know, listening to the mainstream media, you know, go and talk to people that are on the ground. Actually, if you if you truly are interested, go and see for yourself. And so that's a huge lesson. You know, the, mm. the, the, the most profound conversations I have with members or, you know, peers is, really authentically listening and dealing with, you know, the facts that they have, and then mm. also being open to different points of view and different sets, sets of, of data, because, you know, data can be manipulated, et cetera, but factual, you know, to be yeah. as factual as possible is critical. You know, there is, there's so many lessons that come from that. So that's one, that's a big, uh, that's a big aha for me. Kim, for a quick question before you get to the next one, um, I know you know people make emotional decisions a lot of times or yeah, come to emotional conclusions um and we often sometimes put the facts aside what was it a business example that you can remember where someone was kind of talking emotionally about something when they get down to the facts it got was there uh, it got very clear i guess that maybe they were right or maybe they weren't right is there one that you could think of that uh that comes to mind um you know, I'm sure there's, there's a mirror. one doesn't come to mind immediately, mm. but let me, let me dwell on, yeah, on go ahead. Because it, you know, there are, you know, there are so many, for example, in the, in the crisis of 08, you know, um, who thought that Bear Stearns was going to go out of business? So in the week before Bear Stearns went under, there was a lot of emotion around, you know, listening to what was happening. The government's going to come in and protect. Now they did protect some and not others. That's, that's for the conspiracy theorists among us as to why that happened. But, you know, those types of emotions, you just didn't know. And so a lot of decisions were based on hearsay, the emotion at the time, the collapse of the market. You know, we were very fortunate in that we had some very smart people that said, listen, we're just going to hunker down. We're going to work through this. And it did take two years to work through the particular situation, a variety of different issues. But our, our primary lender was like, stay calm. You know, this is not going to be talking to the people on the ground. Exactly. And so, 
you know, it's very, very easy to get caught up and make an emotional <laughs> decision. Right. It's very difficult to step back mm. and breathe and sort of yeah. apply the 24 hour rule, you know, the sleep on it rule. It's tough when yeah. everything is going to hell in a handbasket. If you were to listen to everyone else, you'd be like, oh, everything's dried up. We're doomed. And talking to the actual people, the person was kind of, listen, we got, we got this. Don't worry about it. Right. Yeah. Sometimes that takes wisdom, experience, and I'd hate to say this, um, age and the benefit of having been there, done that and looking back. And so, right. can, you know, who do you tap that can give you that, not necessarily reassurance, because yeah. at those times, you know, it's all bets are off. But somebody that can provide perspective, help you breathe, help mm. you think through it in a careful, pragmatic way. Mm -hmm. um, I interrupted you. Was there another lesson that you had from YPO, like from my success or mistake? The second biggest lesson is around the whole area of trust. And, you know, it's become very, very difficult, you know, particularly in the political world today, in whichever country and environment you are, to trust. Because, you know, the moment you, you, you know, you put out, um, you know, let's say you, you embark on a particular strategy, you share with somebody, and then you read about what you shared in a private conversation the very next day, splashed across uh, the airwaves. One of the big differentiators that I've learned is, you know, the, the importance of trust in a relationship, a business relationship, in any relationship, but particularly in the context of our organization. We have a saying that says we scale trust better than anybody. And the reason we do that is when members join, we teach our members how to interact with each other on the trust basis. I, de I described it and Cameron spoke about it and, and with John. That concept is so powerful. And we have a penalty. If you break that trust, you know, you, you, you'll be, you won't be invited to participate in that group any longer. And so, Trust takes on a whole different dimension. It also gives you the ability, I spoke a little bit, I mentioned vulnerability. It enables you to be a little vulnerable and to say, hey, listen, I don't know it all. I know something, but I don't know it all. And I'm trusting you with that vulnerability through your experiences. Can you help me with something? And that's extraordinary. So those two elements, I think for me, stand out uh, amongst a plethora. I mean, there've been so many so many values um, and, and lessons learned, Jeremy. So how do you, in a, obviously you bring together people who don't know each other, come in, they become vulnerable and trust. What are some of the ways that you teach people to, you know, cultivate that, that trusting environment? Great question. So the first thing is it's a process and it's a, it, it, it is a little formulaic to begin with. So there is, there are a set of norms that everybody agrees to such like we are not going to disclose anything that we have discussed to anybody, not to my spouse, not to my attorney, not to my, my best friend. So norm one, you're always, you're going to show up and you're going to attend these. Um, you, you're going to get together and you're going to attend these, you know, as a hundred percent. And, you know, some of our forum groups, you know, maybe you can miss one or two a year, but it's show up and be accountable for yourself. And then it's the utilization of a specific language protocol. So there's no judgment. There's no uh, prescribing and giving advice. Um, there is caution and care for language. You know, we're not going to throw F-bombs around and be disrespectful and, you know, make value judgments of any kind. So again, part of the norms. And then there's a process for giving feedback. There's a process of communication starters where you get... Um, where you where you declutter, you know what's going on in your daily life, and you focus on being in the present, being authentically you, and being open to receive uh, feedback and experience, and to giving and sharing experience. So that whole process is very defined, it's very well uh, established, and then we train we train our members and we train our forum our member forum moderators to actually deliver on that on that promise. And then it's up to the group. You know, once the group coalesces, you can have a group of 10 strangers. They go through that training and that formation experience together. They develop their norms. And then you're away to the races. And then it's a matter of going deeper as those relationships evolve and develop. And extraordinary, extraordinary things happen. The depth, the caring, the learning is something, 
it's something remarkable. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. You know, it's, it's something that should be in any any business in general, you know, having just a core set of values. So things be, can be formulaic so that it's reproducible, you know, That's, each time. Nothing wrong with that, right? Um, you said something before we hit record that struck me. Um, you use the term, this keeps me awake at night. And I love those things. Yes. I mean, not in, a, not in a weird, sadistic way that keeps people awake at night because it means it's that important. Um, and you mentioned um, one of the things that keeps you awake at night is digital transformation. So I wanted you to, to talk a little bit about what you mean by that. Sure. You know, at a high level, everything we do is somehow now connected through digital and technology and the internet and WhatsApp and all of the things that in our daily lives we couldn't do without. Alexa waking me up in the morning and playing Elton John um, or Eartha Kitt in my case, because I love Eartha Kitt. And your listeners will hopefully Google her now. <laughs> and my, um, my favorite song is April in Portugal, Avril de Portugal. Um, and I probably butchered the accent there too, but you know, <laughs> digital trend is transformative. It's essential. Um, it is part of absolutely everything we do today and will be even more so in the future. You know, it is very, very difficult from a, a corporate standpoint to, um, one, for CEOs to understand all of the nuances, the development, the speed of transformation in the digital realm. And all of us have to. There's not an organization. Your organization's a perfect example you know, of a digital business with a, with a very human and very real, you know, uh, personal underpinning. And so it's, the trick is how do, we, how do we do that in a way that's cost effective, in a way that doesn't disrupt, um, you know, too much uh, the current business uh, profitability and, um, and efficiency. But it's a big, it's a, it's a big spend for, for everybody. And it's also become ubiquitous in all parts of our life. So the challenges are, you know, how does one stay relevant in that area? How does one prepare for it? How does one get ahead of it? You know, it's probably the single biggest cost driver now for a lot of organizations, highly skilled people, huge opportunities for learning and education It impacts economies and impacts mm. you know, the school system from K to 12. So it's, it's a big one. Um, and then there are obviously narrow areas within that, but that does keep me up at night because it's so important. And my personal journey in that regard is, is I've, I've tried over the last couple of years to become as conversant, as knowledgeable as I can. And I try and do something on a learning basis, whether it's understanding, you know, DevOps or, you know, cloud development or, you know, build versus buy strategies, or, you know, how do you, how do you blend um, you know, the cost, you know, do you do a combination of onshore, offshore? How does, you know, how do, how do the various applications that exist out in the marketplace benefit your members and how do we access that in a way that's both usable, simple, effective, easy, and there's nothing easy about uh, digital at the moment. What worries you most about that? Is it that it's possibly going to disrupt certain industries or not so much on the disrupt. No. I think we listen. We the reality is we're disrupted now, whether we like it or not, and we're constantly going to be disrupted. And disruption is increasing. I think, you know, you could read any you know, well-researched paper, and and that will prove itself out. I think the more important thing is on the um, on two things really, the the reality that we all have to spend and develop and understand and. Um, you know, and really embrace digital on, in all aspects. And the second is, how do we prepare ourselves as human beings to, in, you know, if we, if we acknowledge that we need to embrace and we have to embrace it, and we don't have a choice, then how do we remain relevant? How do we remain human? How do we, you know, how do we not lose ourselves? Um, which I think is going to be the big question uh, mm. of the day at some point. Uh, we're, we're already facing that, right? Smarter people way smarter people than me, you know, are looking at this and coming up with ideas, recommendations, strategies. Um, uh, it, it's, it's a very exciting field, but it's a highly disruptive field. Mm -hmm. Talk about Newly for a second, because this kind Newly. of, this, this kind of 
bridges that, right? A gig economy business for independent lawyers. Yeah. How did you hear about them? What What is that? What do they do? So a dear friend of mine, Michael Roybal, and I were neighbors. Um, when we first moved to Dallas, we were both uh, newlyweds. He's a very successful global trade attorney. And he'd left the big firms. You know, he was being billed out at $750 an hour, uh, probably only getting $100 of that in his pocket. Um, and he decided to go out on his own and built a very successful practice over the last 20 years. And, you know, Michael and I were sitting down um, and, uh, as we would and over a glass of wine, and we were talking about the reality of the service in the gig industry and how, you know, the big service firms all carry a massive amount of overhead. That overhead totally. gets, passed on, gets passed on to the client. So we end up paying for it. Um, and I shared with Michael, you know, and that we use uh, independent attorneys for a lot of our work who come from big firms, who still in some instances, you know, have a liaison with that firm if you need the big firms for really important stuff. And there's a place for both. You need the big firms, not only for name and brand, but for, you know, certain core expertise. But you need attorneys to do a bunch of different things. So um, Michael and um, uh, and his partner, Rosalie, um, said to me, why don't you join? This is an idea that we have a couple of years back. And, um, you know, we, we raised some seed money and we built a platform. And so the whole idea is create a community for independent attorneys. Um, and they have to be vetted. They have to pass background checks. They have to be credible people with a track record, with verifiable, you know, clients and, um, and ability. And we want to, you know, we want to create a, an, a space for them to share customers together, go out and build new business and really provide a home because they don't have that connectivity and that glue and that camaraderie of working in an, in a, in an operation all day where they're with people um, and leverage that. So it's very exciting. And um, I think it's, I think it's got the makings of something extraordinary. If it works, um, you know, we'll, we'll take it to independent accountants and our, our niche is independent professionals, mm -hmm. uh, start in the U S and then we'll go broader, broader field, but I love it. And it also gives me a little, it's kind of a Saturday, Sunday, couple of hours on a weekend for me. Um, you know, Michael and I live close, close by to each other. Um, and you know, it's an opportunity to stimulate the entrepreneurial juices. Yeah. I mean, anything that helps with inefficiencies, or cuts off some of the fat is always very valuable. And there's a lot of that in that, you know, if you're hiring an outside firm, they're billing a certain amount, the person's collecting, you know, there's all these inefficiencies in that process, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and a two-sided marketplace is not easy. So just talk about for a second, who should use the platform like from a consumer standpoint, and then who maybe if there's attorneys listening, who should be on the platform itself? Yeah. If you're an independent a professional attorney with more than seven years experience and you're out there doing great work for customers and you want to leverage, say you're a trade attorney and you need a, you need a, a, a personnel attorney or a real estate attorney, that's an opportunity for you to collaborate. And then any business that's looking to, you know, hire a seasoned capable attorney, at a fraction of the cost of going to, you know, some of the big uh, overhead laden firms, that's what, uh, that's the place for you. And mm -hmm. so it's accessible to everybody. Um, a lot of attorneys have the existing client base, but they go, you know, they go project to project, assignment to assignment. They're not great at selling. They're not great at developing, you know, necessarily a community of peers that they can leverage off of. So it'll help them in all those aspects. And then for people like myself that are looking for, capable people, a particular project, or, you know, and I have a, I have a budget and a limited spend. This is a great place to, to create, um, and, and get additional value. You know, I'm always wondering, you know, Shab, what people you've, they have amazing relationships, really smart business mind. What takes up space in your brain? The other thing that takes up space in your brain is, um, how do we bring grace and courtesy back into the workplace? Yes. Um, Beautiful. Why does that take up space in your brain? And what, what are your thoughts around that? I'm so glad you mentioned that, Jeremy. You know, it's, it's, I've observed in the world today, and I've been traveling globally for the last 25 years. You know, I've been to so many different countries. 
And what I've started to see is an erosion of just the very simple foundational things. I like to call it sort of, in fact, you know, I'm, I'll be putting out a little two-pager on LinkedIn in a little bit called Lessons I Learned from My Mom. And it's little things. It's the small kindnesses in communication. It's respect for others. It's engaging people where they are. It's sincerely, you know, putting yourself in a position to listen to somebody else's opinion without having to agree with them. So it's the little things. It's doing what you say you're going to do. It's, it's, you know, it's saying please and thank you. Um, it's, it's expressing gratitude and not just for the sake of doing it. We've lost that. You know, my mother called it manners. She said, manners maketh the man. You know, it's mm. an expression you've probably heard. It's an old expression. But, you know, we've lost that. I think it's so important to have a conversation about bringing that back in. My 16-year-old daughter has been at a Montessori school since the age of 18 months. And they start teaching you grace and courtesy from the age of 18 months. Hmm. They open the door. They, they help each other. She, she'll help, you know, the smaller kids down the corridor, make sure that they're okay, make sure if they go to the restroom that everything's cool. We don't do that anymore because we've hmm. become... We become so, I think, um, used to crassness and crudeness, and you know, and I'm, you know, again, I don't want to place my value um, critique on that, but I think there's something deeply, fundamentally um, important about the little things. It doesn't mean that you know you're you have to be a saint. I'm not a saint, and there's no such thing as perfection, and humanity is messy. But can't we just get back to you know, respect for each other, you know. Why do you think we've lost some of that? You know, I think I have some views on it. I think culturally, you know, we've, we've, we've started to celebrate, um, you know, behavior and um, principles and values that are entertainment um, oriented and, and, you know, controversy sells and, yeah. you know, all of that. It's what get eye, gets eyeballs. It's more controversial. Yeah, it's more yeah. kind of in your face. I mean, if people if people can put that in the compartment of, you know, this isn't reality. You don't go, you know, you don't go to a restaurant or buy, you know, engage with somebody that's providing you a service and just, you know, sprout off on them and, and you know, uh, uh, disrespect them and, you know, have a have an emotional breakdown in the middle of a restaurant because, you know, your, your iced tea wasn't good enough. I mean, that's all popularized. Now I'm using a very silly, simple example, but we've popularized hmm. bad behavior in so many ways. And again, you know, again, I'm not blaming digital and, and the, it's, it does so many great things, but I just think as human beings, what I want personally, I, I just want to be treated with respect. You know, I want to be thanked if, you know, I do something, you know, that's worthy of being thanked and that's the little thing. So if we hmm. could, if I could plant a seed with your audience about, you know, knowing what separates yeah. true good people and good leaders uh, and authentic people from those that are bad actors, it goes down to those simple fundamental truths. Um, and I, I think we need to start having more conversations about yeah. that. Yeah, I was thinking about this this past week, and I want to know how do you think we bring that back in the workplace? But I was thinking about this because you know, when you as a business owner, you have people coming in and they treat you a certain way. Some people treat you well, some people not as well, but you love, you like dealing with the people who treat you well and <clears throat> you give them better service, you know, whether it's subconsciously or consciously because you like them and you want to serve them. And I thought about that of, I should be treating the business I do business with like, you know, they're my customer because I want them to like me and want to serve me the best possible. And we, I, I, I don't know why I came to that realization that, I mean, I try and, you know, like you said, no one's perfect, but I try and treat them, uh, whoever I'm dealing with in business and be courteous. And, Cause it's very easy to like, if someone doesn't, you know, serve you in a certain way to kind of like have that expectation and then snap back. But it's, they, I realize like, I just need to treat them as if they were a customer and I'm bringing them on as a customer of mine. So well, it's definitely it's top of mind. I think it's important. And you know, we, when, when individuals come to work, I love your example of the workplace too. You know, the, you come to work, not just in the role with the title and the responsibility, you come as a human being. 
you come with all of the issues that are going on in your life. And let's acknowledge that life can be messy and difficult for all of us. We all go through those waves. And so recognizing that people come with that, why don't we treat people more and treat each other more humanely? So I'm not saying it needs to be, you know, um, apple pie and, and whipped yeah. cream, you know, because there, is, there are facts and you need to make tough decisions. And yeah. sometimes you have to have difficult conversations. But recognizing the humanity that exists in all of us right. and what we need in order to be motivated. It comes down to reputation too. Yeah. Do you, you know, are, do you want to live your life with a reputation that's really spotty as a leader? Um, because then you're going to get what you create at the end of the day. Yeah. I mean, someone told me this and uh, it resonates with me and I do it, but I remember I was on hold maybe for like 30 minutes. I don't know. Maybe it was an airline or something. And, you know, the obviously reaction is to be pissed. And, and I think um, sympathizing with the person, because that person is just a person on the other end. It's not their fault. Yeah. But I'm just saying, you know, calming myself down by saying, you must be super busy over there. And they immediately, they, you know, treating, you treat them like a person and they're like, they can vent a little bit and they realize they then want to serve me a little bit better because I'm, I'm sympathizing with their situation. Instead of me like, why the hell was I on hold for 30 minutes, you know? <laughs> and listen, it is important not to be trapped in, in the drama triangle, you know, and, 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 and buy into, you know, certain things. So it, they, they are things that I have learned about not being too attached to the story but it's also being respectful that that story has power and it has impact for the person sharing the story or, you know, so there are those techniques and things that you learn and it's perspective and you, you know, you and I both know we're going to deal with 25 different things today. And I don't know what I'm going to be dealing with in a half an hour from now. It could be some distress, a medical emergency, you know, something going wrong in a, in a particular aspect of our business. Um, we've got to be prepared for that. And as leaders, you know, particularly, it's important to develop the skill set, the mindset, and to look daily. You know, I'm a work in progress. There is no other way to describe myself. And so it's a daily chore. It's, you know, how do I want to show up today? What's, what is, you know, who do I want to connect well with today? What did I learn from yesterday? You know, those are the types of things that help you progress and I think help you retain that explorative aspect of your mind, which enables you to move forward because otherwise you'll get stuck. It's been my experience. You know, Sean, you help oversee an organization of more than 20, 27,000 members. What, what's the hardest part about your job? Oh boy. Um, I think probably balancing interests, you know, different interests and making sure that, um, a lot of different interests. A yeah. lot of different interests. Yeah. Making sure that those interests um, align, and making sure that in the, you know that from a you know from a communication standpoint, um, individuals understand the big picture, the cause, and really focus on the value and outcome, as opposed to you know I've got a particular beef or a particular I want to you know I want to be the the my, I want my priority to be to be number one helping them understand that, you know, we're an ecosystem, you know, we're a, you know, we're a, we're a, a you know, afraid, afraid to, you know, going down a particular path. And, you know, we've got commitments, we've got things on the go. And so it's balancing all of that. And then, you know, part of that is really keeping the eye on the prize, you know, and the eye on the prize is really being a steward and, you know, providing a platform for extraordinary connections for extraordinary people. And if you keep your eye on the prize, that can solve a lot of a lot of um, a lot of the day to day realities of running any business, quite frankly. Yeah. So the eye on the prize and the 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 underlying the value that you provide so that you kind of use that as a, a North Star to make certain decisions. What beautiful phrase, North Star. I mean, that's exactly what it's about. Um, you know, you mentioned your mom obviously had a big impact on you. I, um, I wanted you to talk about growing up in South Africa. What was it like? How does that well, you know, influence you? It was almost an idyllic, I mean, idyllic, you know, it, life is never idyllic, right? As I said, but you know, both my parents um, were, um, were hardworking people, both entrepreneurs. Um, my mother was one of uh, 
10 girls. My grandmother had 10 girls. Wow. Seriously. 32 first cousins. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. Wow. Uh, all great people. Um, I was very close to all my aunts. Um, and, you know, they grew up, you know, they were Second World War era family. So they grew up. Um, my grandmother had um, butcheries and um, they had very little, but they managed to. How do you even feed on. 10 kids. I mean, oh, that's a great they go question. through like loaves of bread every day. I mean, that's oh my gosh. insane. And girls, you know, how do you feed and clothe them? You know, for a period of time, my no mom, idea. She was sent to, she was sent to a, um, a convent for a period of time um, because my grandmother was, was juggling. So she went off for a couple of years to the Newcastle Academy um, because she was juggling too many things. But you know what people, this is where your question earlier about how do you get through tough times? You know, when you've got love, when you've got a community, when you're built with grit and determination, and I think, you know, the concept of the greatest generation, you know, the, the greater the, um, the trial that one faces, if you've got the community and you've got, you know, and you've got that, I suppose that like framework network. of love around you, you can get through, you can get through a lot. So it was a fascinating uh, time growing up, I we were very. I was very blessed that my mother had very dear friends, uh, a Mauritian South African family called the Ray family, who were instra, you know, I would say instrumental in my life in terms of providing, um, you know, the kinds of family familial relationships um, that that I that I still respect and admire today. You know, these extended relationships between families you know, um, are starting to dissipate somewhat. Um, you know, mm. we would we would spend vacations um, at our friends' uh, homes. Um, we would do Christmases together, New Year's together. And, uh, you know, so that growing up was amazing. I think, the, you know, another big part of growing up is I, my parents had a, um, had a, a, a African uh, gentleman by the name of Peter Nglovu as their houseman, their house uh, manager, um, who was with us for my whole formative time growing up. Um, and I, I, there's a book in this, by the way, because it's a very emotional story, but he was not allowed to leave our house after six o'clock at night. He had to have a pass to work and live in our neighborhood. All these just bizarre um, dehumanizing apartheid rules. But, you know, the bond that I formed with him and my, he was like a third parent. Um, mm. And you speak to my sister, you know, my brother, there was just this incredible uh, recognition, one that something was wrong, but oh my God, what an amazing man and what an amazing relationship. Um, and then just the beauty of the country, you know, it's an extraordinary people, uh, extraordinary group of people, extraordinary place geographically, so much potential. So it was a privilege growing up, despite the very strange, bizarre circumstances, you know, that people were living in. Yeah. You mentioned the emotional part for him. What was, what was his sentiments that he described to you about, well, you know, about it? One, you know, he had to be very careful in public in the way that he treated us, touched us. He was a very physical guy. So, you know, he would put us to bed every night. He would hug us. We would, when we would, you know, when we had a, you know, fell out of a tree and, you know, sliced a, a leg or something, he'd be the person to patch us up. And many years later, you know, I, I retained my relationship with him until he, he died. Um, but, you know, he went to, my parents got divorced and he went to work for a really dear friend of my parents. And I'd go and see him every year. And in his room, there were pictures of, you know, my sister, brother, myself, and, and he literally called us his babies. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, the difficulty for him was, his inability to express that very important part of his life, uh, and excuse the emotion, but yeah. you know, it it was very tough for him. But you know, he didn't dwell on it. He he re, he just retained the sort of unconditional care, deep affection for us, um, and we retained that same relationship, even though you know we'd moved seven hundred miles away. You know, there was there was no daily connectivity, you know, certainly from the time we were teenagers, then after I emigrated, I saw him less frequently. But you know, the, the indelible lessons that, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that he, that he left was, 
people are people. And, you know, when you're loved and cared for, race disappears, color of skin disappears. Right. Um, <clears throat> profound, profound lesson. Yeah. To you, it's normal, you know, because you live in to hug some, it doesn't matter, like the color of your skin, the religion, but someone else who didn't experience that. I mean, it's hard for someone who didn't live that and experience it to probably even grasp what you're saying, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, my brother Greg does a lot of great work. He's got a diversity business um, and, he, and he goes and he teaches big companies, big Fortune 500 companies. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, kind of as a white guy, grow, having grown up in South Africa under apartheid, he's there up on, on, you know, in front of these groups and he's leading sessions on the importance of, of you know, authentically understanding how you can connect at a human level. And it's yeah. tough for people. You know, if you've not experienced it to your point, how do you, how do you, you know, how do you de-layer that? How do you take all of those life experiences where somebody has told you that person is bad because of that, that, you know, religious group is nasty because of that. How do you, how do you de-layer that? So, and we yeah. all have it within us, by the way. I mean, I have seen miraculous things, particularly through, you know, through YPO where, you know, we, we don't advocate. We are, a, we are, not religious. We don't take an, uh, a political advocacy position. And when you put people together who you, would, you wouldn't even think would have the ability to talk to each other in a trusted environment, it just miracles happen. And, you know, that's, that's what gives me hope in the world, by the yeah. way, because I see it all the time. Yeah. First of all, Sean, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And I appreciate it. And thank you for sharing your stories. And, um, I just want to be the first one to thank you for taking your time and sharing your wisdom. Um, and on my list, I haven't read it yet, but born a crime by Trevor Noah is on my list oh, to, to, uh, to read. I don't know if you've, you've read it or, or heard of it, but that that's, yeah. it's kind of a crazy story. Um, and I'm, that's definitely on my to-do list. You've got to read it. And you know, he's, he's a great South African export. I, I just can't say enough about him. In fact, he came to speak to, in, in March this year, we had him as our closing keynote at a big um, event for over 3,000 members in Cape Town. Hmm. And he got a five-minute standing ovation. Wow. And, you know, he's just, he, you know, he's, he's the real deal. Um, you know, I grew up very privileged um, in South Africa. He didn't. And, uh, you know, not that my life's any less important than his, but what, a, what an incredible... Um, an amazing human being, a truly yeah. amazing guy. Yeah. So thank you, Sean, for sharing your story. Where should we point people towards? I mean, obviously, you know, we could send them to uh, YPO.org. YPO.org. Um, we'd love to, if, if, you, if you're a CEO in uh, any part of the world and you run a qualifying business and you'd like to both give back and, and learn and um, be part of a community where it's about, you know, putting in as, as much as you put in, you know, you'll get out. That's a promise and guarantee from me. Um, we'd love to. We'd love to. Um, we'd love to have you look at it. And awesome, Jeremy. Just thank you. Um, yeah. What an absolute pleasure, and thank you for all you're doing. Thank you. Check out ypo.org. Thank you. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the sand right now. I feel like a hundred grand